Welcome, thank you for coming to the session and that this is being live streamed. So when you do ask a question, if you want to give your name, you can. If you don't want to, what can I say? We're sitting with a former chief here, so <laughs> as it goes. But as I'm sure you are very much aware, especially if you attended the last session, that this is Sir Alex Younger. Please give him a round of applause. Do I need to do the bio? Because I mean, all right. <laughs> so long, so long. It's all long. lies anyway, don't I know, worry. seriously, come yeah. on, we know how it is. <laughs> you know, a little bit of embellishment. Um, so, Sir Alex Younger, who I will refer to as Alex from here forth, is the former chief of the Secret Intelligence Service. I always like that title than, better than MI6. That, Secret Intelligence Service can sound, sound like really, yeah. <laughs> you know, chef's kiss. MI6 okay. is kind of boring because then it's like, oh yeah, there's an MI5. But anyways, um, it's good you can all see his bio in here. I don't want to read the whole thing because, I mean, the fact of the matter is he served in a role six years, which was longest ever anybody served in a role. Um, you were in the army, like myself. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you've done a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, don't know, you don't actually know the half of it, so let's not. I know, go. exactly. It always feels really weird reading the bio and going, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much redacted. So yeah, he was yeah. chief. That's good. There's stuff that he knows that he can't tell us. He'll never be able to tell us. He'll take it with him to the grave. So just know that, and if you ask a question that he can't answer, he will answer it in such an obtuse manner that you'll think he answered, but he did not. So just to make you comfortable. But, but that's not because I'm a spy, that's because I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I'm British American, but you know, I'm, I've now got some polish on me. So, so I do it with a smile. <laughs> but, um, the last, the session was really interesting because you were really quite optimistic. Yeah. And he's... he's this is the thing. Um, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you do what I and my colleagues did, human intelligence, you have to go around asking people to do something that they're very unlikely to agree to. Uh, and you need a thick skin and you need to be an optimist. And that optimism is generally rewarded because the other thing that is intrinsic to the human intelligence business is you've got to believe in human agency. If you're kind of one of those really sort of dreary determinists who just believe history is determined by the waves of social and economic and whatever stuff, yeah, fine. But if you believe that individuals can change things, then my business is the business. And that's fun. I mean, you know, there's, there's bad stuff going on in the world, Suki, but that's quite an optimistic thought. Individuals have agency. That's good. I was in that world too. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, most people, but then I get on certain subjects and I become quite the pessimist yeah, yeah. and um, almost a little crazy, I think. Mm. And that was some of the subjects that were discussed in particular. Uh, I do want to ask if anybody has any burning question from the last session, because for me, I could talk about China and about the implications of where we're going with AI and the decentralization and centralized. I thought that was a really mm. strategic answer that he yeah. gave you. Yeah. And actually, it's true, because when you look at technology, especially in the Western world, we say we want everything decentralized, and that's, it's not gonna, it can't happen. Mm. Especially not if we want to have regulatory powers on anything. You, you don't have decentralized regulatory mm. powers. That's impossible. Mm. So, go ahead. Pontific pontificate. I don't know, ask a question, somebody. I don't want to sit here and talk of my, my stuff because that can get a really depressing factor. So, um, oh, we, we have, have someone back there. Yeah. I can't see yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, yes, please. Hello, yeah. Um, I loved your talk, and uh, I was thinking about the AI, its applications, and think about misinformation and biased information, where somehow tech companies, when they uh, develop a new system, AI system or whatever thing, they go and deploy it directly, and then after, bit of time, we realize that it causes a bit of harm. Uh, 
uh, that if it is something related to in Snapchat, for example, that could cause a harm for child. If it is something related to health or politics, that could cause some sort of a misinformation or or or, uh, or yeah, un untrustworthy information for the public. And somehow, uh, I don't know if there is a way to predict this. Uh, maybe rules or regulations or uh, or some sort of a way where we can evaluate the system before actually go there and, and be publicly used? Well, it's, it's, it's an absolutely huge question, and I, I didn't want to imply there should be a Ministry of Truth, to be absolutely clear. The point of our system is it like it's not that. So there's, there's, there can't be a referee like there, there would be in China. But if you were, and again, you know, it's amazing how quickly you get to sort of existential issues, but the, but the thing here is that we need to be able to um, uh, resolve. Uh, it's about responsibility. So freedom of speech is intrinsic to our democracy. It must be preserved. But I, I personally don't see anything wrong with associating it with responsibility. Um, you know, notoriously, freedom of speech does not extend to being able to shout fire in a crowded theatre. It must have consequences. Uh, the the so what in the digital domain is, of course, that. Um, I think we need to understand the origin and source of any particular piece of information. I think that philosophically, I think people should be prepared to um, to stand by what they say and take responsibility for it. Now, I do that. I, I make that um, assertion with some um, with some caution because, of course, um, uh, one of the beguiling things about this technology is it allows people to um, to say stuff without being repressed or pursued by autocratic regimes or whatever it might be. But on our Western side of the fence, where I hope those consequences don't exist, I think anonymity, whilst I suppose a laudable quality in some respects, is at the heart of the problem. Now, um, I'm not a technologist, but when I speak to technologists, it seems to me that that is fundamentally a technical problem. So much of what I talk about is philosophical or cultural or organisational. But in this respect, we need to be able to resolve information to its origin. Uh, and I think that takes you quite a long way. Would so I, I would want most of the data in the future to be resolvable. Now, um, this is a broad assertion. Of course, AI is another thing that makes that more complicated. With a neural network, you're never even going to know how a, how, a, how a fact <laughs> relates to its source. But I think as a fundamental matter of principle, people, we should be uh, uh, we should work harder to ensure, as a matter of education and technology, that we can resolve the data to the people. It's tricky for a spy to say this. It sounds really self-serving, like I want to hunt everybody well, down who disagrees with me. I, I don't I think you, so. You've I got to take it that I don't I think, think there's that. always a collaborative approach. Yeah. Everybody, it's either do or die, it seems, with the AI discussion right now. And I think that everybody is skewed so far mm. that they really need to come together and that's where I think the most important progress will happen. But there is a lady over there in a green shirt who's had her hand up for a while. And um, hi, Catherine Courtney. Um, I work in space sustainability now, but was 15 years as a senior civil servant. And in my experience, um, understanding of technological risk, particularly emerging technological mm. risks, that resides in the defense and security community and usually behind um, a classification firewall that makes it virtually impossible for that um, understanding and expertise to mm. be shared across mm. the rest of government. How do you move that uh, yeah. understanding out yeah. into the civil side of government yeah. so that civil society and civil government can work on yeah. this, these issues too? And I, and I really recognize the truth of what you're saying. And of course, one of the evil things about the hybrid war is it is exploiting exactly that. We set up a set of boundaries, legal, or um, geographical, or whatever it might be, war and peace, that aren't respected by our enemies, but in, in practice produce these huge knowledge gradients, and we, we've just got to get better. Um, we've got to get, get better at spreading it out. Now, my country, of course, we make lots of mistakes, but actually a thing that I would like to advertise is the National Cyber Security Center, which is, I think, a good example of how you deal with that. So at the one end of the National Cyber Security Center, we've got our Signals Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, <laughs> It's, a, it's a, an incredibly powerful and capable organization that operate with huge capabilities, accountable, I might add, that operates at the, at the top end. 
it owns NCSC. And at the other end of the NCSC, you've got shop front with bean bags, and you know you can come in any time you want and ask a question. <laughs> I'm characterizing, but that is how it works. And I think uh, exactly to your point, we need to be able to, er without um, prejudicing, prejudicing the security of our sources and methods, fundamentally the intelligence we collect is of no use unless it's actually used and implemented. So I think we need to think much harder about things like that. And as it happens, I think the NCC is a great example. Where do you think it's going with, so, you know, ARIA has been set up. So how do you think that's going to play into how we advance our research in well, this Well, I mean, I, I was very much a supporter. This, so this is our, our, our advanced research agency, um, similar to stuff like DARPA and Incatel in the US. Um, when I spoke about market failure in the earlier session, what I meant is that high-risk, high-consequence innovation was often not commercially incentivized, and yet it's the thing that really makes us safe. It invented the internet and put stuff on the moon. So um, uh, I think the state has a role to play. Now, the state shouldn't be doing all the innovating. States are rubbish at intervening, and they're bureaucratic and slow and unimaginative. But, but there is scope for galvanizing that stuff, and, that, and that's the point of that. So, it, so it's, it goes so much more broad than national security, but you know, I'll give you a clue. I was a big driver and supporter of setting it up. <laughs> I don't think it's bad. I think that the people that want to do it are not given enough power to yeah, do it. Yeah, I know, I know. And there are, there are people that are in government positions that want to do it. There are people in military that want to do it, but they're just not given the power. Yeah, and we need to and add a zero as yeah, well, Yeah, and, and I think that's where the, the big yeah. issue, being the British-American person, I can say that in the US, they give money. The defense industry gets money, DARPA, ARPA, you know, InQtel, to mm. develop it. And I think that's what's missing here, and hopefully that's going to be... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, we, we've um, actually, the uh, security community in the UK, we now have the National Security Investment Fund, which actually has, has more money than InQtel. So we're, we're on it. Good news. Hopefully. Yes. Yes, the gentleman, uh, well, I should come over this side of the room, but I will have this gentleman here because he had his hand up. And then we will come to this side of the room. Hi, um, Chris Hi. Harling from Human Thinking. Uh, just question in terms of the core function of intelligence is, as you say, going back to the source. And mm. um, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and then we, we rubbed yep. shoulders with a number of spooks. Mm. Um, and one of the things they always said was, propaganda is propaganda. It's always been the same. So if you look mm. at uh, generative AI, it, it's mm. very much on propaganda. Is it then that your function as intelligence agent is more actually relevant now than it ever has been? But the challenge is actually convincing internally the, the knowledge and being the expert for the truth and not going against the populist belief? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say no, basically. So we, we, our job is to reveal the truth. But we are a last resort. You know, organizations like mine should be used only at the most strategic level, only in an environment where there's no other way of getting a hold of what you need. I spoke earlier about the principles of necessity and proportionality. I believe in that strongly, and I think in autocratic regimes, my counterparts are used in a way that is heedless to that issue of accountability. Um, I, I particularly don't think we should be calling out propaganda. You know that you don't want in Britain it to be GCHQ's job to tell you what is true. <laughs> that our society is organised in exactly the opposite. <laughs> way around. Now, I know it sounds oxymoronic, you know, our truth is, our job is to reveal the truth. But I think in anything um, of political salience, we've got to be super careful. And don't forget, you know, there's a torrid history here. So one of the reasons I was so delighted in the run up to the Ukraine war to see my colleagues so brilliantly expose Putin's lies is it laid to rest the ghost of Iraq where our intelligence was politicized. Um, so, you know, I, but, you know, that was a time when I was serving. Uh, I was an, an operational officer at that time. And, in fact, when I saw that, I, I was pleased because it told me how sure we must have been given the controversial nature. So I think, you know, people like me should be as separate from politics as it's possible to arrange. And this lady here in the white. Mike's coming. Hi, thank you. My name is Emily, and I'm a cybersecurity consultant. Um, and um, I wasn't in your last session, so forgive me if this question was asked at your last <laughs> session. So you work in security. 
And in line with the, the theme of the festival today of the, looking at how we can get the next 10 years right, what do you think, what is a threat that worries you most if you look at the younger generation, if you look, for instance, at teenagers today, um, they will be in their 20s and their 30s in five to 10 years. In that time frame, what is, the, what is one of the threats that worries you? Well, uh, I mean, just to keep it really short, because it's a huge question, a huge and, a, and, a, and a very important question. Um, uh, my particular stick is I am dismayed by the fact, you know, my lifespan spans a period where we, we drank the Kool-Aid, we thought this technology was on the side of democracy. And it turns out that, if anything, it's of net benefit to autocrats. And that's a, that's a wake-up call, and that's a big problem. So my dystopian future is that that's true, and that fundamentally autocratic regimes have the edge when it comes to dominating the key emerging technologies, quantum, AI, synthetic biology, robotics. And if that's true, I think we've got an immense problem. I, I think we're, we're then in a non-viable state as a society. <laughs> we're transparent to our potential opponents considerations of privacy are moot. Uh, and I, frankly, are, we're in a state of chronic economic weakness as well. So I think, you know, let's, let's just be clear. We're in an innovation race. I'm, I'm unashamedly Manichaean about this, which we have to win. And um, in my previous talk, I tried to issue a call to arms around the faith in what we have as a distributed society and the um, latent innovative capacity we have. And I think we should have faith in that, but I think at the moment we're being pretty complacent. Uh, and then it's close in for our kids' future. I worry enormously about our asymmetric vulnerability uh, when it comes to the truth. The truth doesn't matter to autocratic regimes. It does to us. Generative AI and other similar technologies, if misused, could rapidly erode what vestiges of truth exist. And next year we've got some pretty consequential political events coming up. Exactly. Is that not, if that's enough to depress us. Thanks. <laughs> and, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and be a little bit more optimistic, even though I would be more that way. And it would be that I think we should not underestimate the power of people, young people, mm. that they do have a remarkable amount of resilience now. Um, while you know, everybody says, oh no, they're snowflakes or whatever, there is a remarkable amount of resilience. It's just different. As we all know, every generation, people say, oh, it's worse in my generation. Every generation says that. So it's that life is cyclical, it changes, the good, the bad. But I, I must agree with you, I think that when it comes to technology, any technology, emerging, existing, there's a yin and a yang, there's a good and a bad. And the people that are bad actors will overstep any line. There is no line for bad actors. And that's what's really fundamentally the most worrisome thing, is that there are enough bad actors to make it skew so far to the bad part that we are just unrecoverable. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean to be so depressing. <laughs> All right, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> I'm not throwing in any opinions. This gentleman here. Oh, sorry. And then I'll ha come back to you. And then this gentleman over here. Oh. There's a lady there. Sorry. <laughs> it's because you're short. I'm sorry. You're, you're vertically challenged like me. But we're not short. We're just penguins. That's what <laughs> See, I, I just about. can't say things like that. <laughs> yes, you can. He's all, you know, stoic when he's up here. He's not really like that. Trust me. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, uh, Robbie Bone. Um, the world is currently in the process of developing um, an immortal dictator, superintelligence. Mm. So I find it quite strange how we're allowing private companies to develop superintelligence, uh, where that would mean they're going to be the parents of this superintelligence. So wouldn't it be a good idea to force all executives of these AI companies like Tesla, Google, mm. to undergo a lie detector test to check that they are decent people? Because, for, for, for example, Elon Musk, mm. he, he could be completely crazy for all we know, and to be honest, he looks crazy. Um, so why aren't we forcing these people to go lie detector tests to check that they're decent <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I sort of accept the premise. I think... Um, uh, 
So lie detector tests don't work is the short answer <laughs> yeah. to your... Uh, the, the, they're 97% accurate. Well, these days. I could be lying. And this, mor <laughs> this, morning, this morning, they were showing that you can now do um, MRI um, oh. scans. Well, all right, let, let me put it another brains. way. Um, I think you'll find that um, amongst the average tech tycoon, they'll probably believe they're telling the truth, even if um, what they'd say exactly. is, is crazy. But um, uh, look, it's, it's a really key point. Uh, these, um, for all of their... Um, great thoughts and huge uh, ability to, to be, um, to change our lives for the better, they're fundamentally unaccountable. And um, this uh, is something uh, that we need to think about. I talk a lot about Chinese Communist Party, but there's no doubt the concentration of technology power in a few platforms, intrinsically unaccountable, is also something we should be thinking about extremely hard. And I, um, just a really short answer to your question, think that the law as it stands is inappropriate to the extent that it gives tech a free pass and it doesn't treat them as publishers and it fundamentally doesn't attach responsibilities for the consequences of their invention. And I think that's overdue. So all this, what is it, section 201, is it 201, all, all these things, um, uh, that, you know, that we need to get on with that. <laughs> Microphone's coming. And then, yes, and then this gentleman Hello. over here. Hold yeah. on. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Sir Alex Younger. Uh, Margot from Bolton Capital. I think uh, you're familiar oh, yeah. with our team. Yes. Um, um, I, I guess my, my, my question is to, to what extent do you feel intelligence services, uh, not just in the UK, but other European countries like uh, France, I'm from mm. France, are, are actually using novel cybersecurity uh, or other ma machine learning techniques and supervised and unsupervised mm. learning. Companies like, I guess, Tessian that have been around for a while uh, mm. before the whole you know, AI wave that are really disrupting in machine learning. Uh, I had a capstone four years ago with the French army. We were mm. tasked to, to crawl through Twitter and uh, unsupervised learning to help uh, position the, mm. the troops in Mali. So to what extent do you feel now governments are really adopting some of these new technologies, particularly in army services, yeah. uh, which are a bit more archaic, maybe in nature. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's, um, it's changing really, really quickly. And um, you look at the disasters in Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance, fundamentally derived from just a complete lack of understanding of the social and political conditions in the target community. And whilst you, know, you don't have significant digital penetration in those countries, you already, I think, have a capacity to, to have a situational awareness that would not have existed previously. And I'm beguiled by the possibilities of improving our decision making, including in the decision in, the, in, the, in this space through these technologies. Um, the benchmark for B will be, we always get beaten up um, in my community for our intelligence failures. It's a, I mean, I'm not asking for sympathy here, but we are, only, we are defined by our failures in the intelligence business because when we are successful, you all know nothing about it. <laughs> uh, anyway, the big one, sorry, this is a therapy session now, but the, <laughs> but, the, but the big one we always screw up is coups. We never get coups and we never really get revolutions. And that's because they only really happen when they're unexpected. And they're, our job is really to tell you what's in the head of the dictator or the general or whoever. And of course, almost by definition, they don't see it coming. <laughs> Yes. Now, these technologies are remarkable because they can do mass sentiment. And so I think, um, I would hope now, the Arab Spring was the nexus of individual decision making and mass psychology. I would hope now that we would see that coming if, through the adroit use of these technologies. Now, that, you know, that's not, not really an MI6 thing. We're an operational service. We're not an analytical service. But I think that these technologies can completely revolutionize our capacity to understand the world around us. And while I'm on the subject, by the way, I think we excessively fetishize secrecy, um, that most of the truth is available through the application of these amazing open source techniques, private sector, et cetera. Again, you know, we should be the thing that garnishes that rather than the other way around. Now, my world, the operational world, has also been fundamentally disrupted by AI and other technologies, but I don't think that's the big story here. It's about our understanding of the world around us. Okay, so that clock down there is telling me we got like 30 seconds. And he has to leave and get on a plane, and I have to leave and be somewhere else also on another stage. So I'm going to say, what would be... I, she asked already about the 10 years. I can't even ask that You stole my question. I would like to say, what is the... What area 
do you think that people really need to work on in order for AI to be a positive force for the good? Well, I think it's a question of imagination, isn't it? I mean, most of the stuff we talk about is unintended. I'm really struck by the way in which um, we are suffering at the moment from creator's remorse. A lot of the people at the core of these technologies are now standing up and going, oh, hang on, <laughs> better pause. Um, so uh, I think it comes down to education in the end. I don't think I don't want to inhibit um, uh, innovation. I've made clear already in the last session my skepticism about the capacity of um, of innovation, oh, sorry, of regulation to, to do the job. But I would like us to be having conversations like this and for people to understand their responsibility, particularly in tech, for the consequences of these inventions. Okay, well, please, everybody, a round of applause for Alex. And apologies that he cannot stay and answer any more questions. And um, what else am I supposed to say? Uh, I forgot. Thank you and good night. Uh, yes, thank you very much for coming. I hope you have a great day at Cargex.